Okay, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, this, we're close to capacity, so if, if at all possible, start filling in to the library or stand in the hall. Uh, we can also take a few more people in the balcony, but we have to stop at 15. So uh, fill in where you can. Uh, my name is Rose Wessel, and I started No Frack Gas and Mass as a gathering point for information to answer two basic questions. Uh, what would this large gas pipeline, how would it impact Massachusetts? and what can we do about it? Uh, I had some idea of the complexity of the first answer to the first question, and I had no idea of the complexity to the second answer. What, what can we do about it? Uh, there are currently in place several key provisions in the law that work against ordinary citizens standing up for the preservation of their own land and their own communities. The 2005 Energy Bill set in place exemptions for the oil and gas industry to the Clean Air Act the Clean Water Act, the Superfund law, and a few other um, main regulations. And the power endowed to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, otherwise known as FERC, has given them power to override local, county, and state laws and ordinances once a permit is issued by them. Uh, still, this pipeline project is in the early uh, stages of planning. Uh, they're in the pre-application stage, according to FERC's terminology. This is when we have the most sway over the future of our communities. When we stand up and speak out in numbers, and I don't think numbers are gonna be a problem, um, when we stand up and speak up and call our legislators and our regulatory offices with questions and concerns, when we file petitions like the one that's being circulated around to ban new gas pipelines and to champion efficiency and alternative energies, clean energy, uh, our leaders become aware that allowing a project like this to go forward also has political consequences. So first we have to understand though the nature and the scope of the proposed Northeast expansion and what its environmental and health implications could be, what its financial implications could be as property values abutting the gas pipeline drop precipitously, um, what the environmental cost would be, not just to us, but to the people who live near where the gas is fracked. That's out through Pennsylvania and Ohio, Louisiana and Texas, where this gas is coming from. And also for the whole planet. Um, methane is, or natural gas is often cited as being the clean energy. And it's not, it's methane. And there are a lot of leaks along the way. And methane, when it is leaked, goes up into the atmosphere and it's a much stronger greenhouse gas than carbon. Uh, recent studies have shown that there's basically no advantage over oil or coal to methane because of its action in the atmosphere. So to help us understand better, uh, we have Bruce Wynn from BEAT who will give a presentation and uh, Katie Eisman, uh, Joy Johns and Sandy, Sandy El um, Elia who couldn't be here today unfortunately. Um, We've been the core group up until now, but people are joining really fast. Uh, we have been so happy to have Bruce and Jane from uh, Berkshire Environmental Action Team as mentors and now as fiscal sponsors as we um, learn how to manage this and as it grows into a statewide coalition. So thank Bruce very much <laughs> for coming to speak today. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Is that volume going to work for people in the back? Can everybody hear me if I talk like this? Yeah. 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 Great, because I don't know what I do if you said no. This is how I talk. Um, as Rose said, I'm Bruce Wynn from Berkshire Environmental Action Team. Um, we are not the authorities on natural gas pipelines. However, we have had to come up to speed very quickly, as this wasn't on our radar more than a month ago. So we've been digging in, hitting the books, hitting all the research we can, phone calls and that sort of thing. And what I'm going to do is share with you some of what I've found out. I want to tell you that when, when, I, when I use numbers or when I, when I use anything here on the slides, I try to find the most reliable facts I can. So you'll see that a lot of the information up there is from Kinder Morgan, from Tennessee Gas Pipeline, and probably the third source that I use most is ISO New England. 
Um, if you don't know ISO New England, they're basically the air traffic controllers for our electric grid. So um, they're the authorities on a lot of these numbers. So I try, to, I try to use very reputable sources when I get these numbers. Um, first of all, let me tell you what it is we're talking about. This, again, is a Kinder Morgan slide. I should mention, um, Kinder Morgan is the parent company of Tennessee Gas Pipeline. That, that's why I may be using the, the, the two companies' names interchangeably. They're not the same thing. But Kinder Morgan, again, is the parent company of Tennessee Gas Pipeline, who would be constructing this pipeline. Um, you can see that that pipeline has its origin in Wright, New York. That's just a little bit west of Albany. There are a lot of pipelines that come in there, so it doesn't really originate there. But the new pipeline would originate there, Wright, New York, and come east, enter Berkshire County at Richmond, if you know Berkshire County at all. Um, there's already an existing pipeline. It would, it would follow for a little ways an existing Tennessee gas pipeline and then branch off and start angling to the, the northeast until it gets close to the northern tier of towns in Massachusetts. And then it would head east and go to Dracut, Massachusetts. Um, that's what they say is the, the terminal, the end point for this pipeline. And I wondered why Dracut, Massachusetts. I grew up in the Boston area and I knew very little about Dracut, so I wondered why Dracut. It turns out that Dracut, Massachusetts is already quite a natural gas hub. There are pipelines that come in there from the Maritimes up in Canada, from Quebec, that go down to the Boston area in Everett, Massachusetts, where there's a terminal. Um, and I'll be talking more about that in a minute. Um, so th that's why Drake it. So basically, this is a pipeline that's going to traverse all of the state. It's a high pressure line. It's about 30 inches. It, it is 30 inches in diameter is what they're proposing. And here, it, oh, it, if you look at the bullet points, uh, expandable, we're not quite sure what they mean by that, but basically the, the ways you can expand a natural gas pipeline is you, you can add capacity as they say, putting another pipeline on the side of it, which is what they're going to do with this pipeline in the place where there already is a pipeline, in other words, down by Richmond, or you can increase the pressure. That's another way to um, get more product through the pipeline. And it turns out that actually with these pipelines, they're, um, they're changing the pressure in these pipelines on, on a, um, an hourly rate anyway. Um, that's just how you get more, pipe, more product through the pipeline and control for who's using how much. But there's another reason for increasing and decreasing pressure. You and I look at these pipelines and we think of them as highways for natural gas. Certainly the natural gas companies look at them that way too, but they have a second way of looking at that, and this is a storage container. So if they need to store more natural gas, they also have this long container. They can store more natural gas in it just by bringing the pressure up. Here's a more recent Here's a more recent um, map from Kinder Morgan, and you can see now um, what's different about this is it actually does come down. It actually does come down to Richmond. The, the earlier one you see actually started a little higher up, maybe in the uh, North Adams area, that area. But the newer map has it down in um, Richmond, coming in a little lower. This is part of a much bigger expansion that's going on all across the Northeast. They call it their Northeast expansion. And actually, the Northeast expansion is part of um, a very rapid deployment of natural gas infrastructure across the country. So this is going on all across the country. We're, we're just one small note of it. An important note in their mind, but, but still one note. And what's driving this is the um, the fracking industry that's going on just to the, the west of us, um, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and ac ac oh, we hear the most about Pennsylvania and Ohio, but it actually goes all the way down through the Appalachian Mountains, and it goes down, and this pipeline originates down in Louisiana. So as the product comes up, it picks up more product all the way up um, as it comes into the Northeast. Yeah. 
There's an already in existence pipeline down there, and that would be expanded. Yeah, yeah. And don't and the arrows mean something else. It doesn't. It's not direction of flow. So pay no attention to those yellow arrows. It does mean something, but it doesn't mean that that anything is flowing in that direction. This is a Kinder Morgan Tennessee gas pipeline slide that they present to their investors. Notice uh, Marcellus figures very prominently in there. That's all fracked gas. In other words, a big selling point for them and their investors is that this pipeline will be carrying fracked gas. For those of us who care about the environment, that is hardly a selling point. Um, not only is this going to be carrying primarily fracked gas, but Tennessee Gas Pipeline makes the point that they are the big player. If you want to get into the Marcellus shale play, as they say, then Tennessee Gas Pipeline is how you play it. Um, note the 43% in very big, bold, large type. That's their slide, not mine. So this is their advertising point to investors, that this is fracked gas because everybody has heard about fracked gas and certainly you want to invest in it. So this is where they're going with this. Excuse me. Yep. Are you also aware that uh, Kinder Morgan also is associated and is part of the uh, group of France company and the national fuel product? There, there are several more companies up there. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're the biggest mover of natural gas across the country. Um, Kinder Morgan, um, the, 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 the Kinder part of that name um, is Richard Kinder. He's, um, his net assets, according to Forbes, is $10.3 billion, um, and, yet, and yet he wants us to pay for his pipeline. Um, before he came to Kinder Morgan, he was the COO of Enron. And he quit nine months Right. This, this is their slide showing that this is just one part of their, th th these are their other projects that have, are either ongoing or recently completed. You can see that they are really busy people. Um, these are all their products, all their projects that are either ongoing or, or have been um, recently permitted. So again, this is all one big expansion intended to make the best use of the fracking natural gas to our west. That's what's going on here. Um, I just want to take one minute in case you don't know what fracking is. Um, when you think of getting oil or natural gas out of the ground, you probably have this image in your, in your mind of a reservoir under the ground, and you do something akin to putting a soda straw down there, a pipe, and then you suck up the oil, and natural gas comes up with it. Well, we've been through all that. Um, that product isn't around as much as it used to be. So we're now basically scraping the bottom of the barrel. We knew about this stuff before, but it wasn't economically feasible to get it. And it wasn't as environmentally friendly, to put it nicely. So the way, you get, the way you get this product is a little different. You drill down into the shale bed, and then the drill bed actually makes a, a, a 90 degree turn and travels horizontally. And whenever you see an image of this, you see something like this. But try to think in three dimensions. When it comes down and goes out left and right, it's also sending out tubes towards you, away from you. It's more like the spokes on a wheel. And then what you do is, you see that the natural gas in the rock formation doesn't exist as a pool. You can think of it more as a lot of isolated bubbles of natural gas. So there's no efficient way to get it, unless you do this. You put down water and about 600 chemicals, some of which we know what they are, some of which we don't. You put it down into your straw under very high pressure. And as it goes sideways through all of the shale, it cracks or fractures. Fracking is short for fracturing. It fractures the shale bed. And then all those little bubbles get to run together. 
And now you can use your soda straw analogy and bring it, bring it back up. Remember, you put it down there under high pressure. Some of that mix of water and all of those chemicals, for instance, benzene and, and a lot of others that are almost unpronounceable, they come back up. Some of them stay down there. So whether it comes up or stays down there, it's a problem. Because if it comes up, we don't know how to dispose of it properly. Um, you know, we hear about water usage in a lot of industries, but when you use water in the fracking industry, it's gone from the hydrologic cycle. We don't know how to get it back. The stuff that doesn't come back up, it can get into aquifers, it can get into water supplies. So that's a problem too. So whether it all comes up or all goes down, it doesn't. You have to deal with both issues. You have to deal with getting rid of what comes up, and you have to get rid of the possible aftermath of what stays down. So this is what's going on to the west of us. Um, out in Pittsfield, we have, we have a family that, that actually moved out of Pittsfield um, to get away from this. They were lived in Pennsylvania and came out here. They were part of lawsuits out there. Um, and now they're out where we are and it seems to be following. None of us are gonna get away from this. That's why we really need to take a stand. I'm going to get to that. That's an interesting question, and I'm going to get to that, because it, it gets um, into the issue of reliability of natural gas as a fuel source, which is one of its big selling points, and I, just, I do want to address that. Can you repeat questions when people ask them? She asked if it's profitable. Is it profitable for the companies to do this? In a sense, it is. It really is. In another sense, in terms of, of standard economics, it shouldn't be, and I'll, I'll get into that. Um, so who is this for? You know, I hear people saying, you know, I'm, I'm all for this pipeline because I heat my house with oil, I recently converted to, to, to this, it's cheaper, it's cleaner, and all of that. This is not primarily for home heating. If you have home heat, if you have natural gas in your home, what you're displacing is probably home heating oil. Natural gas is cleaner than that, it's cheaper than that. I mean, if this is not counting what's going on to the west of us but right at your point of using it, you can make a case that it's cleaner, it's cheaper, but that's not what's driving this. What's driving this is electric power generation and possibly export. Now, I don't know that it's being driven by export, but I'll get into that in a second. Um, power generation is the big driver for this. And when we have cold weather, you've probably heard that we need more, we need more natural gas when the weather gets cold. The reason for that is that residential users and business unit users have first dibs in whatever comes through that pipeline. Whatever comes through the pipeline, the residential users and business users have first dibs. That's because the gas, the gas companies that supply homes and businesses make hard, firm contracts with the natural gas companies. Electric generating stations don't do that. They buy on what's called the spot market. They don't have firm contracts. They're taking their chances. So if, if we have a, a very cold winter like this, then they're taking whatever is left. That's why you hear about the winter needs. The, the peak demands for our area are actually in the summer. The reason that we have problems in the winter is because of the energy used by residences and businesses, but homeowners and businesses are in no danger of losing their natural gas supply. Even the gas companies say that. That's not what this is about. This just came to my attention recently, and I'm not sure what's happening here, but in the industry journals, what they're most excited about now is export of natural gas. The price right now in Europe is about double our price. Um, in Asia, it's even higher. So what they're very excited about now is the prospect of liquefying this natural gas, compressing it so it becomes a liquid, and then shipping it overseas. Um, this is on the federal regulatory agency's site, this, this FERC, they're called, the site that regulates this sort of thing. These are the, the new permits for import um, ports, places where we can bring in natural gas. Here's what the same slide looks like for exports. Um, this is what they're, these are, these are um, pending. Um, they've already approved six, six new 
port terminals for export, and they have 21 pending for export. Okay, um, I just want to point out that if we start exporting natural gas, that's going to, uh, I mean, the whole reason we would be exporting it is because Europe and Asia are willing to pay more than American customers are, which means if you want to compete with that, you're going to have to pay more. That's the short way of saying if they start exporting, the price goes up for us. Mm -hmm. stated quite clearly that the gas was not for domestic use. It, it, it said in part of their proposal, I wish I could remember what page number, but I don't, that this was for export only. They're saying that the natural... That's what they put in their documents that they submitted to Boston. Hmm. I'd have, to, I'd have to see that one. I haven't, I haven't heard that, but I'd be interested in talking to you and finding out where I can see that, because my understanding was the whole rationale for, the, for this um, in terms of Massachusetts economy is that we need it for power generation. So that would be an interesting story. Um, Yeah, I'd, I'd be very interested in that. But although it is, they are, but they are giving us a, a, an inkling here that they have export on their mind. Um, but in order to do that, you have to get it out to the coast, which is where this is going. This is going to Drake. It. We do have ex, we do have import terminals along the New England coast. We don't have export terminals along the New England coast. But all it takes is a permit to change an import terminal. You do have to have compressors and that sort of thing. I mean, there's an infrastructure um, investment too, but you can change an import terminal into an export terminal. As a matter of fact, um, right now I, I was reading that the, um, the federal government is saying that they can turn, they can grant export terminal permits right now in a matter of eight weeks. They say they can turn this around in eight weeks. Mitch McConnell says that's unacceptable. There's no reason it should take eight weeks. So that just gives you the idea. Now, I'm not talking about the permits for pipelines. That takes longer. But, to get a, to, but they really want to get this stuff out there. So anyway, here's the claim you see. Natural gas is clean, cheap, and reliable. And I, I just want to address this, because if anyone is, is going to argue for this pipeline, they're probably, probably going to start here. Um, so let me start with, with clean, and I'd like to ask, compared to what? Remember, we're not trying to make the, we're not talking about residences, we're talking about power generation. These numbers are from ISO New England. Um, I can't think of who would be a better authority on these numbers than they are, so I went to them. Here are their numbers. The average natural gas plant in Massachusetts produces 1,210 pounds of carbon dioxide per megawatt hour. That number meant nothing to me. Um, when you say average gas plant, you're talking about power generator run on natural gas. Yes, exactly, in Massachusetts. Um, the number didn't mean anything to me, but it doesn't matter because it's just a matter of comparison, comparing two numbers. Um, that's the average for natural gas plants in Massachusetts. ISO New England also says that the average for all sources of power generation in Massachusetts is 910. So, I mean, how is that possible? Because we all think of natural gas as the cleanest thing around, other than solar, wind, hydro, and nuclear as well. We have nuclear in our mix. What we're doing right now Natural gas has served a very good purpose. It has brought us away from oil. It has brought us away from coal. We're at the point where it's done that. We're retiring our oil-generated um, furnaces, um, power plants, rather. And coal is just about a thing of the past in Massachusetts. Now, natural gas is competing with other sources. Now we have basically the big ones right now are nuclear, solar, wind, Hydro. That's what, if anything, and, and, the, and the nuclear, 
excuse me, and the nuclear um, plants are going to be aging and coming offline at some point. What we need to think about is where as a society do we want to go? What is natural gas really going to be competing against if we start increasing the infrastructure? 30 to 50 year infrastructure? Is that the direction we want to point our energy policy? Um, I don't. Um, I, I assume that a coal plant would be much higher than that 1210, but I don't know how much higher. Um, the question was, how does a coal plant, where would a coal plant fit in that scheme? Um, I don't know the number for a coal plant. Um, Massachusetts has some state goals for its greenhouse gas emissions. And the goals right now that it has set for us itself in legislation is a 25% reduction by 2020 and an 80% reduction by 2050. It's hard to see how we're going to bring numbers down that way if we start increasing our dependence on any fossil fuel, even natural gas. So here are some other issues you might want to think about if you're thinking of this as the clean source. Um, methane, as Rose has already said, there's a, a tremendous amount of leaks in the distribution system. The estimates are all over the board, but they range from 4% to 12%. No matter where it is in that range, that's not good. 4% to 12% loss in the distribution pipes is unacceptable. And remember that methane, which is what natural gas is primarily, is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. We hear about carbon dioxide because the numbers are bigger for carbon dioxide. How much carbon dioxide we're emitting is much higher than how much methane we're emitting. So the natural gas that doesn't make it to the power plant leaks as methane, and that that does make it to the power plant is burned and produces carbon dioxide. So either way, we can do better. You know, a lot of towns are, are saying that they're converting their fleets over from diesel to natural gas-powered vehicles. The studies have said this is a wash in terms of climate change. Now, there are other things that you may be benefiting from, for instance, particulate em um, emissions in diesel is pretty high, and you do get an advantage there. But if you're looking at greenhouse gas emissions, it's a wash. Changing from diesel to natural gas doesn't get you anything in terms of climate change because of the leaks. We also have habitat destruction. These pipelines often go through very sensitive areas. They go through wetlands. And as Rose said, there are a lot of exemptions to environmental laws given to this industry. Um, some of them are imagined, by the way. I would, if anybody is on a conservation commission, I would encourage you to stand up and, and contest this if that's how you feel. Um, because some, some of these, um, some of these supposed exemptions um, may not exist. This isn't tried very often. Certainly for the federal statutes, there are some very clear cut exemptions. And there are some that don't exist. For instance, um, an environmental impact statement. You still have to file an envir environmental impact statement. So that I, I would like to see how, what they're going to file for an environmental impact statement um, for this pipe, proposed pipeline. Yeah, the new pipelines, some, yeah. Some of what's been looked at are specifically the new pipelines and they're found to be leaking and the reason is, that it's not that we don't have the technology to fix them, is that it goes back to the fact that this is a big northeast expansion. They're working faster than the regulators can keep up with them. They're working very, very quickly. They're finding a lot of leaks in the new ones. They're finding leaks in the fracking fields. Um, they're finding leaks in a lot of these places and it's interesting because FERC, the permitting organization for these, hasn't been able to keep up with the, with the applications very well. And the New York Times, I think it was the New York Times, did a study to look at you know, what's going on here. 
because FERC's explanation was that they just have too big a turnover in, in employees to keep up with this and they can't keep people. And you wonder, you know, with the job market the way it is, why can't they keep people? It turns out they're all leaving to go into the industry. So, so it's true they have a big turnover in, in, in personnel, but it seems that the reason is not for um, anything that we appreciate. So yeah, they, they, we are talking about the newer pipelines as well. Yep. They're going to put these below the ground. They, 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 um, 24 inches. Yeah. I've, I've heard lower than that too. Yeah. Um, they'll let us know at some point. But but typically they they go a few feet under the ground. They may put them lower. They may. Mm -hmm. You say FERC says three to six. Repeat questions. Okay. One of the issues with the lease is being addressed in the state of Delaware. Um, and Kinder Morgan and the Tennessee Gas Pipeline and a couple of others are actually being sued by investors and environmental groups. Um, in the Delaware Chancery Court, with a court doc at CA9318, it's because since the year 2010, $3.2 billion has been improperly disappearing. Yeah. Hundreds of millions of dollars on quarter after quarter. So the investors are now suing. That's all the money that was budgeted and allocated according to Kinder Morgan and the Tennessee Gas Pipeline for repairs and maintenance and inspection. Mm -hmm. So the repairs and maintenance and inspection are not going on as they're supposed to be because they are pulling 50% of their budgeted allocations out. So no wonder. I'm, I'm not going to try to repeat that, but uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, a lot of you heard it. Um, yeah, and I am going to get to that issue in, in, at some point. And afterwards, we can be passing a microphone around. Yeah, yeah, why don't we save the questions as much as possible for the end, and then somebody can go around with the microphone. That way, everyone can hear the questions. Um, Rose has some things to, to talk to say about organizing after I'm done, and after after all of that, we we can we can do questions if that works for everybody. Um, that way everyone can hear the questions. Um, okay, so anyway, that, that's my point, that this is, not a clean, this is not a clean fuel, at least not in the context in which we're talking about it, which is energy generation. Um, cheap, I have to ask, compared to what? Imagine, ima again, we're not talking about home res heating of home residences. We're talking about power generation. What is it comparing, what is it comparing to? If we don't use natural gas, what are we using in this state? Remember, coal and oil in this state are just about gone. So what are we talking about? What is the current fuel cost for solar? What is the current fuel cost for wind? Hydro. Um, I throw nuclear in there, um, as long as nobody throws anything at me. But this is, what it's com this is what it's competing with. Currently, we have nuclear, hydro, solar, wind. This is, when you say it's a cheap fuel, this is what you're up against. And last year, 50% of the state's new energy was either solar or wind. Um, now, remember the numbers I, I showed you before that shows that our average carbon dioxide output um, is lower than the average for um, a natural gas generating plant? This is part of the reason why. We're actually doing a good job with renewable energy. We're doing, we're doing a good job. This is what we should be encouraging. We shouldn't be saying, oh, if we have a shortage, we therefore need to increase our use of natural gas. These are proven technologies. You know, when, when people say, well, so we have to wait for solar to come along, we have to wait for wind to come along, it's just not true. The reason those numbers are low is because they have come along and they're working. They should get a little more help from us. So what will the price be in the future? This is a really volatile commodity. 
I've watched the price of this thing go up and down based on weather reports, how investors feel on any given day. Now, what happens when we start exporting this, which is all the rage right now in that industry? I can tell you that Europe right now pays twice what we do. I can tell you that Asia pays more than that. That's going to be an upward pressure on the price. And you saw the export applications. And I can tell you from reading the journals in the industry that they're really excited about this. So this is going to be an upward price um, pressure. And right now, you know, 48 50%, that's how much of our power generation comes from natural gas already. We're going to increase that further. If they're the only game in town, what will they charge us? If we put in a pipeline that's a 30 or 50 year infrastructure, are we going to be committed to that? Are we going to be committed to whatever the market will bear? Where are we going to go? If they raise the price, where are we going to go? We're already at 50%. How much higher do we want to go? As a matter of fact, ISO New England in their 2013 annual report said that their number one concern right now was our dependence on natural gas. They have 50% natural gas in their mix right now. And they want to know what happens if something happens to this industry. Where do they go? What happens? Now, I have to tell you that if you read the rest of that report, they also give you the impression that they feel that they're over the barrel and that what they're suggesting is a wider pipeline, a bigger pipeline. So if you read the rest of the report, that's also one of the conclusions, and I have to tell you, I think they're just not being creative enough. If this is their number one concern, I think they can look at the mix and find another way to handle this. Okay, this is getting more to what you were talking about. Um, how reliable is this source? These wells are notoriously short-lived. One survey says that the average well in fracking gives you half of what it's going to get in the first five years of its life. After that, it falls off very quickly. Why do I say one survey? Well, that's because, you know, I, I started by saying I like to find the numbers that I trust the most. Um, there aren't any numbers for this because the way that the fracking fields report their numbers to the federal government do not allow for this kind of analysis very easily. But the Post Carbon Institute, what they did is what they took all the raw numbers and they did a painstaking analysis looking well by well. What did it produce this year? What did it produce the following year? What did it produce the, the year after that? Which takes a lot of work. And this is what they came up with. These wells are falling off. Now, they're not the only ones to, to have said this, but they did the best detailed study of raw data. Other people are saying the same thing, which leads to, to lawsuits like this. So you have to wonder, um, like you were talking about, so you have to wonder, we do have increasing production in this country. How can you have increasing production if you have wells falling off like this? Well, it turns out that the wells are being drilled faster and faster. We just keep adding new wells very, very quickly. And the New York Times did a um, story about this not too long ago, which, uh, which culminated in all these lawsuits. And what they were saying was that the big companies found themselves in a bind because these wells started petering out so quickly. So what they did is they went looking for investor money by saying, look, you want to be in on this, right? So you take in a whole bunch of money. The investors keep you running. And now those wells start going dry. You go out, you look for, it's, it's a pyramid. It's a pyramid, and it, and it, and it involves a, a lawsuit on one of the biggest companies, and um, it seems to all be going through Goldman Sachs. They're, they're, they seem to be the people who are at the, the core of this. Um, so I'd have to ask you, solar, wind, hydro, when do they run out? Um, I think the natural gas will run out first. So I, I don't think this is a very reliable source for us to base our, our energy policy on. Um, the other thing I hear is that, you know, we have, to, we have to deal with, we just had one of the coldest winters I remember, and we had some problems with, with the energy mix. I don't think that the response to that is to build a bigger pipeline, but let me just say this. 
There's a hundred year record of temperatures in New England that says we have a steadily increasing winter temperature here in the Northeast. That's something that you might want to think about when you're formulating an energy policy more than this winter was cold. Just another, I, I just want to also tell you that in addition to being up at 50% of our energy mix, Natural gas, whatever the price of natural gas does, historically, that's what our, energy, our electricity um, rates do. So I would suggest that we need to get away from this. We need to get away from something that is so closely driving our electricity prices, especially something that's going to be as volatile as natural gas. This, again, is ISO New England's chart. Okay, there is, another, there is another fuel source, and that's called energy efficiency. Um, this, again, is ISO New England's chart, and bear with me here. I, I know some of you probably are scared of charts, but I'll try to make this quick and painless. The blue line is um, projected or anticipated demand. And uh, you probably can't see the dates down there, but as soon as that blue line starts going up, we're looking in the future. So these are projections. Um, the beginning of the graph is real, based on real data. After that, it's projections. So this is a projected graph of energy demand. The red one takes that energy demand and subtracts from it what we've seen in energy efficiency programs. You've probably all heard of mass save, um, programs to get people to weatherize their houses, switch to more efficient appliances, change to more efficient lighting. That is a big effect. And the difference brings it down to the red line. And this is what I, this is how ISO has always reported these numbers. The governors of New England asked ISO to produce one more kind of graph for them. They, um, let, me, let me just say something about the fact that that blue line and red line look perfectly straight going out. There's a reason for that. What they do is they take the most recent change and they assume that's going to be the change for the next seven years or whatever. So when you do that kind of analysis, of course you get a straight line. They say, okay, here's what we recently got for energy savings. What if we get that same level of energy savings for the next seven years? So it gives you a straight line because you're always adding or subtracting the same amount. The governors asked ISO to do something different. They said, okay, now, now do what, what about what we think we're going to put into energy saving? What about what we think, what the commitments we're going to make to increased weatherization, to mass save programs, that sort of thing? What happens if you subtract that instead of the same thing every year? When that happens, they got the black line. So energy efficiency, you can think of as another energy of, uh, source. And we actually can do a good job with that. Think of if we took, you know, we're talking about a $1.2 billion expansion of, of natural gas pipeline. Imagine if we took that much money and told people, here's something for putting solar on your house. Here's something for weatherizing your house. How much would that do as a society? Which direction do we want to go in? What do we want to do with that kind of money? Do we really want to build it on, spend it on a pipeline? This isn't conservation. This is, this is energy efficiency. Let me just explain the difference. Energy efficiency says... Let me explain conservation first, because then it's easier to juxtapose. Conservation says, please help us by being a martyr to the environment. Close, turn off your lights, turn down your thermostat, all of that kind of stuff. If you live a little less comfortably, we can all get some advantage here, and we won't use as much fuel. Energy efficiency says, don't change your lifestyle, don't do anything. Just use a better refrigerator, weatherize your house, use better lighting, all of that. So yeah, for anything like this, there will be diminishing returns. You wouldn't expect it to go on forever. 
And I haven't looked at the formula or the model that they used to get that black line, but I would hope they took that into consideration. I don't know. So I would make the case that natural gas isn't clean, isn't cheap, isn't reliable. I think we can do better, and I think we already are doing better. Um, and there you have it. And I'm going to let Rose talk now. And um, when she's done, if there are any questions, um, we'll both field questions. Thank you very much. Let's see. I need to cling to a podium, so pardon me. <laughs> OK, um, what we're finding out is uh, landowners are being approached by the pipeline. And one of the best things you can do at this point is to deny them access to survey your land. What that does is it buys us time to find out what's going on and to organize, put up a, a petition in place, it's already in place, to file with the governor um, and, and the state legislators to try and stop this project. It gives us time to research what the impact would be to us personally in this area, as well as to the environment. Um, if you are approached, also please let your, your town select board and planning board or conservation commission know, because we're finding out that some people that were approached went to their select board and their select board didn't even know there was a pipeline proposed yet. The company has not gone to every single town and announced that they're planning on doing this. Uh, one of the parts of the process for them to get um, permitting from FERC is to have public meetings with towns once they have a plan in place. But they have been phrasing it that they will have meetings with whatever towns request them. So you do, you do have to request. So uh, if you know that you're probably in the sites of the pipeline, ask your select board to please request Kinder Morgan to have a meeting, a public meeting, explaining the environmental impact and their exact plan once they have one in place. Um, a couple of times, um, people that we've been talking to mentioned that they, as they're approaching for a survey, they start talking about eminent domain, which is actually something that they can do if you refuse. Don't be intimidated. You're not at the point where they are looking to get your land yet, an easement to your land. They are in the surveying process. You can tell them, no, I don't want you to survey. The process of negotiating um, easements is still months away, and it's only after they receive a permit from FERC. It's called a permit of, permit of public convenience and necessity. Once they get that permit, it's much harder for us to uh, stop them. So the longer we can put things off and the harder we can make it um, for them to get through and get that permit, the better off we are. Really? And they said, oh yeah, well we're working with the electric company, so really they're going to go on our land. And then they said, well we can, you know, give you money, we can, uh, you know, pay. So, so because there's already an easement there, can they just slide into that easement? Uh, no, they can't. They, just, it'll have to be a separate easement. Re yes, they have to file for a separate easement at that point. Um, the, the trouble is to the people that are approaching for surveys are basically sales reps. Yeah. So you need to, if, if what they say doesn't sound sound, you have to contact the company and ask um, the company themselves. And I, I'm I, sorry? And yeah, um, uh, there's somebody here who's actually living with a pipeline uh, close by in Sandusfield. That's that lower one that you saw on the map. And uh, they will say a lot of things that don't turn out to be true. Um, you can also contact FERC and ask what your rights are as far as that goes. You can ask for anything in writing, which any conversation... Yes. To, to get it in writing so that you have something to document down the line. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the comment was get everything in writing. That way you have it documented. And if they start contradicting themselves, 
you have it in writing and you can start bringing that to uh, regulators, you can bring that to your legislators and let them know that this is happening. And also, if you've already been approached, you can um, uh, submit a letter saying that you do not want them to survey. And we have on the no fracked gas in mass org website, we have a copy of that letter that you can print out and mail right to the company saying, no, I don't want you to survey on my land, which is another good legal protection. Yeah, I think it's going to be question and answer. <laughs> In Pennsylvania, they've made a lot of people really rich by getting the fracking rights to people's land. Are they going to start offering people lots of money to put the pipeline in their land here? It, it's not a lot of money. It's, uh, uh, Bruce gave me the statistics. That it's a dollar per inch of the circumference of the pipeline. So for every, f per, yeah, but it's, it's a dollar per inch per foot. So it's a 30-inch pipeline that they're looking to put through, so that's $30 for every foot. That's not very much. Um, one more question. I heard that in this industry it wasn't profitable, and the way the fracking companies are doing it is with basically government handouts. Yes. What are the handouts? Are they tax credits or uh, erasing regulatory rules or what? Um, I believe there are um, federal funds that go to pay back their investment on the pipeline, but part of the way they're doing it too is they have, they're raising tariffs on ratepayers. So all of us, whether we're using the natural gas, uh, if you buy electricity or natural gas, you are paying an extra tariff that funds the pipeline. And this has already gone through. It was proposed by ISO New England and NESCO, which are regulatory, industry regulatory agencies, and all six governors of, of New England. So the tariffs have already been approved to go through to pay for the pipeline. I don't know when they'll start showing up on our electric bills, but they will eventually. What's the approval process? I mean, how much of a role does the federal government have in this? Uh, it's basically up to FERC, as far as I know. That's the Federal e um, Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, basically, they have to go through a pre, what they call a pre-application process. Right now, they're even before that. They're in the survey stage. Once they get um, all their information together of where they think they can put the pipeline, they have to submit for a permit to FERC. Uh, during that pre-application process is probably our best time to speak out, but during, after they file the application, there are a certain number of months during which we can speak up to FERC and make our case of why we don't want the pipeline. Uh, FERC looks at environmental studies. It looks at what landowners along the pipeline um, have to say about it. Once they get that permit, it's, it's very, very hard to override the permit once they get the go ahead. So it's, it's a very short period between when they file the application and when they get their certificate that we technically can have public hearings with the gas company and we can file with FERC. We can file documents um, saying why we don't want it on our land, why we think it's a bad idea. Um, Let's see, there's also something called an intervener. Do you know more about that? Intervener status, um, our, our group has gotten intervener stat status on other issues, not FERC issues. But basically what it means is that you're in there not as one of the parties that normally would be involved in this, but you're telling the court, even though you're not one of the two major parties here, you have a status here that you want to be able to come in and have a voice. Um, it, it's called intervener status, and you have, to, you, you have to make sure that you apply for it in the window of opportunity, and that once you get intervener status, I can tell you, you have to make sure that you're active because courts in general would like interveners to drop out. So, and, and they will use inactivity as a reason to drop you out. So once you get your intervener status, also use your voice. Can I just add two, two follow-up uh, Sure, sure. Where, where are we in the process as they apply for the application, and will that be public when they do? 
Um, it will be posted publicly on FERC when they do. They have not yet. Right now, they're taking general surveys to see if they can get a pipeline through. Um, they're looking at geological uh, information as well to see how hard it'll be to get it through. They're looking at where they're gonna have to contend with wetlands. Um, they're still negotiating how to get over the Deerfield and Connecticut rivers. Uh, they're running into trouble getting over because the only bridges that exist are railway bridges in that area and the railways don't want fracked gas. It's highly explosive. So, <laughs> That, that's one thing in our favor, but their other option is that they have asked about in other towns is to tunnel underneath the river. And that's near Montague. That's one of the deepest spots along the river aside from Turner's Falls. Ecologically, I can't imagine how that would be allowed, but they have a lot of power over the EPA. So um, right now they're looking at where they can make a proposal, but they haven't filed for their application because they're still putting that together. Um, there's a really important issue that I don't understand, and I'm wondering if there's any conservation law lawyers here. Um, four of the towns in Western Mass are part of the Westfield River Wild and Scenic, which entails um, protections against development uh, across, along the Wild and Scenic portions of those rivers. Um, there are also of course, the wetlands issues and the local conservation commissions, a state wetlands protection law. And what I don't understand is whether FERC can um, erase all of those protections. The wild and scenic protections have some federal involvement too, which puts them on a level with FERC. But does anybody know? Um, actually, it's in their citizen's guide. If you go to the FERC website, there's a citizen's guide and they clearly state in there that uh, because of what, once there is a permit of public convenience and necessity, they can say that this is in the public good. They even say that in their own videos, that it's in the public good to have a gas pipeline and that that overrides any local, state, and even some federal um, uh, protections. Do we know which federal protections? Because uh, I, th I think this is a really important point. It's one of the strongest tools we have in Western Mass. Yeah, it's definitely one of the strongest tools we have. And I, I hope that conservation commissions throughout will step up and speak out now. And if there are any conservation lawyers or uh, conservation commission people or people like Meredith Babcock, who's standing up, she's from, West, she's from Westfield Road. So I was just gonna say that there's a bunch of information for people um, in this room back here about that. Yeah. Just because if that does prove to be one of the strong voices, it would be wonderful if everyone was familiar with that and could voice that um, when they're approached or if they're approached. Yeah, th I think it will be one of the stronger points of, of our case, hopefully, is that there are protected wetlands, there's protected forest land in the way, and the rivers are in the way. And I, th I think that's probably one of our stronger points. Oh, uh, Bruce does want to make one more comment. I just wanted to say one, one thing before we wrap up, and that is just to assure you that no matter whether it's local, state, federal jurisdiction, your voice counts because what I've seen in the industry journals is the industry is worried about two things here. There's obviously money, whether or not they can make their capital investments to, to build this thing, even though some of it, a lot of it comes from ratepayers. But the second issue that they're concerned, they say if anything's going to stop this, it's either going to be that they can't raise the capital, or number two, their words, not mine, nimbyism. And if you don't know what that means, it means not in my backyard. So they're calling everyone in this room NIMBY people. I don't know about you, but I have an idea that you've all been very concerned about fracking before it ever threatened to come through your backyard. This is not about your backyard. So we're saying not in our backyard, but we're also saying not in anyone's backyard. And we're also saying, think, think, of, think, think of the arrogance of a company called Tennessee Gas Pipeline with the parent company from Dallas, Texas, saying that somehow our voices are less than theirs because we live here. If that isn't turning reason on its head, I don't know what is. So thank you.